you guys for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Serena Dellinger. I am the current president of the Concord Wildlife Alliance. If you haven't heard of us before, and maybe you found us through Facebook or our website or a friend, um, we do a lot of different kind of educational stuff and other programming around the Concord area. Um, and the best place to stay connected with us is through our website, Facebook, or you can get on our email list and I'll drop our email in the chat um, and you can send us an email and I'll add you to our email list. We are a local chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, which is a chapter of the National Wildlife Federation. So we work through these different agencies and um, they help us out and we help them out. Uh, we're just more of like a folk, more um, community focused. So we do a lot of signature programs. You can see um, our biggest things are, we do a monthly educational program and we try to do a monthly outing. We do um, two times a year, we do native plant sales. We promote certification of yards through um, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and the National Wildlife Federation. Um, we do a couple demonstration gardens. We support Hunters Feed Cabarrus County. Um, we do different habitat restorations, adopt a stream, and we also do our Kids in Nature Day, which was just the other weekend, um, if you joined us there. We are also the chapter of the year. So there's 18 chapters all across North Carolina. We were so excited to receive this award last month um, in Raleigh at the Governor's Conservation um, Award Banquet. And this very cute little goat statue will be presented to the um, at the city council meeting um, this month, and they'll put it on display for us for a little while up at the city, and then um, we'll be working on finding it uh, a permanent home or a home that it moves around to to show off this accomplishment. So wanted to share that with everybody. And then um, our big upcoming event is our fundraiser, Give Thanks for Wildlife. That will be November the 6th from 6 to 8 30. We'll be doing a barbecue dinner and a chili tastings by some local um, firefighters. And it'll be at Cabarrus Brewing Company. So those are just the big overview details. We're working on getting the sign up out and everything else, but that is just about a month away. So um, we hope you will consider joining us there. Um, that program supports our Hunters Feed Cabarrus County um, and the processor that does that is Rocky River. So if you're a hunter, consider donating a deer through Rocky River and all of the venison process goes to Cooperative Christian Ministry. That is all I have. And I will let our speaker tonight is Carrie DiGiacco. She teaches at Pfeiffer and I'll let her introduce herself. You're still muted, Carrie, by the way. All right, there we go. You should now be able to see my screen and hear my voice, yeah? Yep. Okay, excellent. So I'll be talking today about invasive species and the importance of native plants. I'm a professor at Pfeiffer University in Meisenheimer, which is about halfway between Salisbury and Albemarle. And um, I've been there, I guess this is my fifth year at Pfeiffer now. Uh, before teaching at Pfeiffer, I taught at Queens University of Charlotte for 11 years. Um, and I got my PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And before that, I got my bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Louisville. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so I've got a lot of experience in um, working in both aquatic and terrestrial habitats, but the past 15 years-ish, I've been uh, very much focused on uh, learning about the invasive species in our area here in North Carolina, learning what we can do to uh, try to mitigate that problem and uh, trying to educate people on the importance of native plants. So, uh, so that's me and this is what we're talking about. And this is a subject that I am just really enthusiastic about. So I'll try to keep myself on task so that we, um, we finish up in the appropriate amount of time here. All right, let's see, move my slides forward. There we go. Okay, so um, this is a screenshot from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology webpage. 
Um, you guys are probably familiar with these statistics. You probably saw um, articles on this coming out a few years ago um, when, when this was um, first published. So nearly 3 billion birds gone, um, or you know, more appropriately uh, worded, uh, we have nearly 3 billion fewer birds now than we did uh, five decades ago. So that is certainly a disturbing trend. Um, similarly, within the last few years, we've had some studies come out that have uh, remarked on the declining insect abundance. Um, and we've got studies coming out from all over the world, from um, Germany, Puerto Rico, uh, Brazil, all over the place, um, showing that the number of birds that we have, or sorry, the no, number of bugs um, that we now have is uh, much lower than that has been in the past. So this is uh, insect apocalypse, okay? So what is really happening, why it matters, and how we can all help. Oh, whoops, getting all ahead of myself there. So the Xerces Society um, is a, an organization that um, is specifically focusing on invertebrate conservation. So if this is something that you are interested in, um, this is a group that you could uh, reach out to and uh, learn more and find out uh, more resources about uh, what you can do to help. Okay, so um, one study that came out just a couple of years ago uh, was looking at the insect populations um, from studies that had been published all over the world. And they found that about half of those studies pointed to habitat change as the main driver of insect declines. Um, and that this factor was equally implicated in bird and mammal declines. So I'm frequently going to uh, put the resource down here just in case you are interested in learning more about these sorts of things. Um, I always like to give people more resources so they can learn more. So uh, the fact that habitat destruction um, is a problem should not be surprising to any of us. Um, as we drive through our cities, our neighborhoods, our landscapes, uh, we frequently see these sorts of things going on. Uh, the human population is increasing. And of course, all those people need places to live, places to shop, all those sorts of things. So um, we do see more and more habitat destruction. And of course, as we're destroying that habitat, um, there's no place for um, birds, mammals, insects to live and less um, stuff available for them to eat. So um, this couple of folks, um, Ellis and Ramankati, put out uh, a paper over a decade ago now um, that was basically trying to summarize all across the world um, how much of the land humans have actually taken over um, and how much we have used for our own purposes um, and how much of the land is actually still wild in its natural state. Um, and it was very, very shocking to find that less than a quarter um, of all of the land mass in the world uh, the ice-free landmass, so we're not counting Antarctica here, uh, but the ice-free landmass in the world, uh, less than a quarter of it is still in its wild form. And if we look at the map here, we can see that primarily those wild areas are up here in the Arctic um, and down here in the uh, Sahara Desert. So, uh, and we've got some in the central um, desert areas of Australia. So pretty much, you know, we've impacted most of the world that is potentially usable to us. The places that are too cold um, or too dry uh, for our lifestyles to actually persist and that aren't usable for us in terms of agriculture, uh, whether it's growing crops or uh, raising livestock, you know, we've, we've pretty much um, impacted every place um, that we can. So zooming in on the United States just a little bit, we can see uh, a little more. So Eastern uh, North America is certainly um, completely um, overwhelmed with all of our different kinds of anthropogenic biomes. So uh, rather than having our natural biome of eastern deciduous forest, uh, most times now if we go out outside of a city, we're not encountering any of that natural biome anymore. Uh, most of what we're experiencing is uh, populated forests. We've got um, areas where we are grazing animals. We've got areas where we're growing crops tree farms, all that sort of thing. So uh, this study here uh, was showing us the percent land cover um, that, uh, that is currently considered urban. 
and showing us how we expect the percent of urban land cover to increase within the next few decades. So as you can see here in North Carolina, uh, will mostly be considered urban land uh, by the mid part of this century. So as our landscape is changing, we see more and more of this sort of thing um, in, in our um, habitats. So it's really no surprise that uh, the mammals and the birds and the insects are not able to, uh, to thrive in these kinds of habitats. Frequently in those habitats, we uh, bring in our, our own new kinds of plants to use for our landscaping purposes. Um, many times we are using exotic plants or non-native plants in our landscaping in our um, developed areas. So here we've got a, a Chinese holly tree. Uh, we've got vinca or periwinkle, a, an exotic vine. We've got our liriope, a monkey grass, uh, nandina or um, sacred bamboo. Up here we've got a glossy privet or a, um, a variety of Japanese privet. So these are some of our most common um, types of, of plants that we common that we use in landscaping today um, in our developed areas. So there are a couple of major problems with our use of these exotic species in our landscapes. So the first problem is that these plants rarely contribute anything to the food chain, and we'll come back to that. Um, and the second thing is that these exotic species can become invasive. So it's important for us to um, understand what exactly it means for a plant species to be invasive. So we define invasive plant species as non-native species that get into wild areas and significantly alter the ecosystem. Okay, so then we may follow that with a few questions. First off, how do they get into wild areas if we're planting them in our yards or in our uh, landscaping around office building complexes and things like that. Many of these seeds are carried by birds, um, such as the nandina or privet, and many of them are carried by the wind. Uh, so it's very easy for these seeds to be transported into uh, wild areas. Once they get there, how exactly do they alter ecosystems? Well, for one thing, they compete with our native plants for space, water, sunlight, nutrients. And that's pretty easy to understand. Um, they also alter the nutrient cycling in our native uh, wild areas. So there have been a few studies lately that have shown that the um, many of our, our invasive species um, have increased rates of nutrient cycling. So you may have noticed that things like um, privet, for example, um, the leaves on privet, the ch Chinese privet or um, autumn olive, the leaves will last a lot longer on these plants than they do on most of our native shrubs. And some of our uh, invasive plants are evergreen in a way that most of our native plants are not. Uh, and when the leaves fall off of these exotic plants, those leaves are very quickly broken down so that those plants are very quickly able to take up those nutrients again, uh, which means that the native plants um, are less able to access them. Our native plants have a shorter uh, growing season than many of these um, exotic ones. So they're not awake and active as early in the spring uh, to be able to access a lot of those nutrients that were released when leaves fell in the fall. Most of these um, exotic invasive plants are also not edible for our native herbivores. So they don't contribute to the food chain. Well, many people may say the birds are you know, all over my Chinese holly right now. They're you know, going to town, just eating all kinds of berries off my Chinese holly or my uh, Japanese privet and so on. Okay, the birds may indeed be um, eating those, those fruits. Uh, we have had some studies that have shown that the nutritional quality of, uh, of berries on invasive plants is not equivalent to that of our native plants. So that could be uh, meaning that basically our, our wildlife are eating something that's more equivalent to junk food um, than giving them the uh, amount of nutrients that they need. 
In addition to that, um, that means the birds are now going to fly off into the woods and they're gonna poop those seeds out someplace else, which contributes to the um, invasiveness of these plants. But something that's more important for us to think about here is the baby birds, okay? So the adults may be able to eat these berries off the bushes, but 96% of our native birds need bugs in order to feed their babies. So we need to make sure that there are enough plants out there for our bugs to eat so that we have enough bugs to be able to feed those baby birds. Most native insects can't eat non-native plants. They simply have not grown up with them evolutionarily and our, our, the chemicals that are present in our native plants um, our native insects have learned to deal with evolutionarily over time. And when we bring in plants from um, halfway across the world, those plants have chemicals that our native species are not adapted to, they're not used to them and their guts are not able to digest them. Non-native plants contain chemicals that our native species simply don't recognize um, and they can't, can't digest. So that means if within our landscape we have a lot of non-native plants, then that means that we have less food available for our insects. If we are developing land and removing non-native plants from that land, and then we come in and uh, you know, build our shopping centers and our um, housing developments and so on, and we put non-native plants in our landscaping there, then we are really erasing um, a bunch of area that would have been available for our insects to be able to eat and flourish and provide food for our baby birds. So um, Doug Tallamy, who some of you might be familiar with, he has become quite famous over the past decade or so since first publishing his book called Bringing Nature Home. Uh, he is a, a researcher uh, first and foremost, and he has been working with his grad students over the last 15 years uh, studying uh, the bugs. Uh, Doug Tallamy is an entomologist, so his love is in insects. Um, and so he has done a lot of work studying the types of insects uh, that are able to thrive on native and non-native plants. So this is from one study that he did with his students about a decade and a half ago. And this showed that the amount of caterpillars that you can find on native woody plants is more than eight times as much as you would find on non-native woody plants in the same area at the same time. So our insects are clearly preferring to be on the native plants rather than the non-native ones. Um, they are much more interested in consuming the leaves of our native plants because that's what they're able to digest. Okay, so another question here is, are all non-native plants invasive? No, absolutely not. Uh, we have things like you know, tomato plants and cabbage and, um, and peaches and things like this who aren't, those plants are not native to our area, um, but neither are they getting out into wild areas and spreading and taking over. But many of our non-native plants have the potential to be invasive. And most times we don't recognize that soon enough to be able to catch it um, to stop those invasions from occurring. So this graph here, I know it's kind of blurry, but this is showing the spread of Chinese privet in the South. Um, and this is going back to 1880 when Chinese privet was first brought over to uh, the southern US from China. And we have very, very low populations for decades, decades. And it wasn't until um, the 60s that the population of privet really started taking off in wild areas. And now we have some forests where the understory is just completely dominated by Chinese privet to the point that um, native plants are not able to grow there. Oops. So um, it can take a hundred years for us to recognize that a species is becoming invasive. And of course, by the time these plants are um, very abundantly noticed in our wild areas, it's too late for us to be able to um, take control of that. So this graph here is simply showing that process. So when we have a very small number of uh, non-native plants in wild areas, 
we tend to not notice them. If there's just one every here and there, we won't realize that that is a species that is becoming invasive. It's not until we go further up on this curve when these um, non-native plants become more common in the wild areas that we start to look around and like, oh, wow, look, there's a lot of Mandina out here, isn't there? Well, by that time, it's kind of hard to um, put the genie back in the bottle. So it is really important that we, um, that we consider the fact that whenever we're bringing non-native plants into our landscape, there is potential for them to become invasive. They may not become invasive this decade, they may not become invasive within the next 40, 50 years, um, but we need to keep in mind that anything that's non-native does have the potential to have a significant impact on our native ecosystems and consider that. Another thing for us to keep in mind is that uh, we actually spend about $35 billion a year trying to manage invasive plants in the U.S. So that is uh, people who are trying to work in um, national forests and national parks and state parks and, and city and county parks, trying to remove all of the Chinese privet and kudzu and autumn olive and um, miscanthus and all these sorts of invasive plants that are uh, very aggressively trying to take over. If we can uh, reduce the number of invasive plants that are getting out there in the first place, we would save each ourselves a lot of money. Some of our biggest forest invaders uh, these days in our area are Chinese privet, Chinese wisteria, autumn olive, English ivy, uh, we'll typically see a lot of these when we go out for hikes in the woods. And then some big up and comers, ones that a decade ago were not uh, recognized as being invasive in our area. But now we are seeing, yes, these guys are, are quite invasive. Things like Nandina, Chinese holly, and there are various cultivars of Chinese holly. One of the most popular ones right now um, is Burford holly. And there's uh, Nellie Stevens holly. These are simply cultivars of uh, that Chinese holly species. Mahonia, um, and oh gosh, I have a real vendetta against Mahonia because it is just, it is so pokey and sticky and hard to pull. Oh man, I hate that plant. <laughs> and Vinca, uh, Vinca is another one that is making its way into native um, habitats and it's covering the forest floor um, in a similar way to English ivy, making it such that um, few, if any, native species are able to sprout there. Unfortunately, you can still purchase many of these highly invasive plants at your local garden centers. Um, and this, this is really a sore point with me and with many people who are struggling in the fight against invasive plants. Um, the fact that we continue to propagate these and sell them um, and distribute them uh, really makes our fight to try to keep them out of wild areas a tough one. If you'd like to know more about invasive species, and certainly there's tons more to learn about these, um, you can go to invasive.org. So that's a really easy web address to remember, invasive.org. You can learn all kinds of stuff on their website. So if more and more of our landscape looks like this, then the least we can do is choose to use native plants where we can. So instead of using things like uh, privet and boxwood and Chinese holly cultivars um, to uh, do the landscaping around our, our office parks and around our houses. If, oh, sorry, weird bird outside. <laughs> um, if we can use native plants in these settings, uh, then that would actually uh, begin to compensate just a tiny bit for the amount of habitat that we have been um, destroying. This book came out uh, a couple of decades ago. This was written by Michael Rosenzweig called Win-Win Ecology, How the Earth's Species Can Survive in the Mist of Human Enterprise. And he introduces this concept called reconciliation ecology, which seeks environmentally sound ways for us to continue to use the land for our own benefit. So basically what he's proposing here is that uh, the land that we uh, take over for our own purposes, um, things like um, you know, building strip malls or housing developments or whatever, if we can try to share that land with uh, wild organisms and, and make it as close as we can at least to a native ecosystem, uh, making it a place where native species uh, can live and reproduce, then uh, this will be a win-win 
for both us and nature. So I really like that concept. And I've started teaching a class on reconciliation ecology at Pfeiffer. Um, and one of the ways that I um, am trying to incorporate this into uh, my teaching is to basically try to um, figure out ways that we can share our space, our living areas with other species. So for example, this is our, um, our campus at Pfeiffer. And when I first started working there, um, this big ditch that you see here in the middle uh, was simply a, a ditch filled with rocks. Um, this was a ditch to which you know, this hillside drains um, and you know, it, it could be um, accumulating a lot of water, um, erosion could occur. I, it was basically like a, an informal rip rock situation. Well, this area is not being used for anything whatsoever. It's really just an eyesore. Um, humans aren't using it, wildlife's not using it, nobody's using it. So what can we do to take this useless bit of land here um, and turn this into something that we can actually use? Um, so uh, for my class a couple of years ago, we literally spent the first few weeks of the semester moving rocks. Uh, we removed all of the rocks from this ditch. Uh, we then came up with a palette of native plants to put here. Uh, we installed all of these native plants and now we have a gorgeous uh, pollinator rain garden in this place. So now it's, um, it's able to be used by lots of pollinators. We've had all kinds of um, different sorts of insects visit. We've had uh, many, many monarchs visit, lots of caterpillars uh, that have been demolishing the butterfly weed as they should. Um, and it, it's a joy for everyone to walk by. It's become a, a highlight of the campus tour. So yay. So we've turned this place into something that uh, is actually better for us now and better for, um, for the wildlife in the area. So some things that we can do are simply uh, take some of the types of plants that we commonly use in landscaping, plants that are non-native and um, either currently recognized as invasive or um, potentially going to be recognized as invasive very soon, like butterfly bush, the budley eye. Instead of using butterfly bush in our yards, we could use some native bush that's going to fill that same sort of role in our landscaping, like button bush or St. John's wort or a sweet spire. Instead of monkey grass, liriope, uh, there are a variety of native sedges that we have that would be um, really good um, replicates for that in a landscaping kind of environment. Or we could go with another one of our native low growing evergreen plants, Phlox subulata or green and gold or the mouse ear coreopsis. We have lots of options um, available in our palette of native plants that would really, uh, really um, provide beauty to our landscape while also uh, providing resources for wildlife. Uh, Miscanthus sinensis, this is a, a popularly used um, ornamental grass um, that has become quite invasive. We've got so many gorgeous native grasses here. Some people <laughs> laugh at me. I really do have favorite grasses. I love our native grasses. We've got just a bunch of gorgeous native grasses. Uh, there's no, no reason for us to use Miscanthus. We've got so many that are more beautiful than that anyway. So let's get away from the invasive plants um, and try to use some of our native plants in our landscaping. Nandina is a, a popular shrub to use in landscaping. We've got lots of native plants that really have amazing fall color uh, that rivals the color of Nandina. Uh, the Father Gila, the um, Hydrangea, the oak leaf Hydrangea. We've got Itea virginica here. Uh, my Itea have been changing to red already because they're so stressed they've been getting no water. Um, Instead of the Spirea japonica, we've got all kinds of plants that we could use in place of those. Um, I can send along um, to your coordinators here some lists of plants if you're interested in, um, in switching over a lot of your um, non-native landscaping to native plants. I can give you some advice on which ones are wonderful to use. Um, Echinacea purpurea. This is the purple coneflower. Um, and this is, uh, I'm going to highlight here a few species that your organizers from the um, Wildlife uh, Federation here actually have some packets of that they may, may be willing to send out to you guys. So this is a really wonderful um, native species that's good in sunny gardens. 
and we uh, the um, uh, what you want to call it um, horticultural <laughs> experts have become um, they've realized that a lot of us now are looking for native plants to put in our landscape, but they've kind of taken this in a direction that is not necessarily ideal for. Uh, wildlife, and that is uh, they're they're producing various cultivars of our native plants, and sometimes they're calling them nativars. So if you hear either of those terms, uh, this is what it's referring to. So this is what our native purple coneflower looks like, and then this is a cultivar of that species. So um, a cultivar is basically um, when they're growing these plants in in a greenhouse or you know in massive quantities, every now and then they will find a plant that has some sort of weird mutation. And if they really like that weird mutation, they will then take the, that particular plant and they will propagate it so that they'll now have lots of plants that have that same weird mutation. And all of those plants that have that weird mutation are genetic clones of one another. So they all have exactly the same genes. And when we limit the uh, genetic diversity within a plant species or an animal species for that matter, it significantly uh, reduces the ability of that species to be able to adapt to environmental change. And we all know that we are going to be seeing some significant environmental changes in the coming decades. So it is very important that we try to retain as much genetic diversity in our uh, species as possible. Another thing that, um, that's kind of frustrating to me about uh, these cultivars or nativars of our native plants is that sometimes these characteristics that the horticulturists pick out um, are ones that are really, <laughs> they're, they uh, look nothing like the native plant. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is if your purpose is to use native plants in the landscape so that those native plants can be used by wildlife, if you're using native plants that look nothing like the natural ones, they probably don't smell anything like the natural ones, they don't taste anything like the natural ones, you're kind of defeating the whole purpose here. So um, if your goal is to have native plants in your landscape uh, in order to help feed the food web um, and provide something uh, back to wildlife that we have taken from them, um, you will want to try to stay away from native ours as much as possible, especially really funky look one, looking ones like this. Um, the stranger they are um, and the less like native ones they are, um, the less likely it is um, that the bugs and other animals that typically would visit these plants, um, they won't recognize these as being something that they're interested in. Every now and then a, uh, they do have a cultivar that is very similar to, uh, to the native species or the you know, native or, or wild type as we call it. Um, so this powwow wild berry uh, looks remarkably similar to the original. So um, you know, if you can only find cultivars of native plants, it's best if you can focus on uh, the ones that actually look a lot like um, the native ones. But if at all possible, you want to stay away from cultivars entirely and stick with straight species. I know a lot of times it's not possible and all you can find are the cultivars. And if that's a situation, you'll want to simply try to, um, maybe you know, my strategy here is to take one of each of the six types of uh, flock subulata that they have. If I take one of each of the six types, then at least I have six different um, sets of genes there and hopefully they will you know, intercross and then I'll, I'll be retaining at least a bit of genetic diversity there. Um, Brown-eyed Susans or black-eyed Susans, uh, this genus is Rubeckia and there are a few different species uh, within this Rubeckia black and brown-eyed Susan group. Um, and then there are some other Rubeckia species that um, have some various common names, but um, these are really wonderful plants for pollinators. And the flowers on these guys, I've got a few of these um, individuals in my yard that started blooming in May. And last year they were still blooming at Thanksgiving. They probably won't be doing quite so great this year. They have not liked the drought. Um, it's really not rained much at my yard since since last April, so they're pretty stressed. But but these guys typically have a really long uh, flowering season, and they're very attractive to pollinators. So yeah, we've got some really strange cultivars of the Rubeckia 
plants as well. So I just wanted to show you some of those. Uh, but yeah, these guys really don't look anything like the original species. And if I were a bee or a wasp um, or you know some sort of fly looking around, if what I'm looking for is this, and then this is what I'm encountering, I'm not going to recognize those as things that uh, that I want to visit to be drinking nectar or collecting pollen from. Here are another couple of plants that uh, your organizers have a bunch of seeds of. So I just wanted to mention those as well. The, the top one is partridge pea. This is a really cute uh, little annual plant, gets to be maybe one to two feet tall, um, has these really cute little yellow flowers on it. And then there's butterfly weed. And many people right now are uh, very excited about the butterfly weed. Um, Asclepias tuberosa, so this is a species of milkweed, and most people know that the uh, milkweed is what is needed by the monarchs, and we're quite concerned about monarchs because, frankly, a lot of habitat destruction has led to a decline in their food sources and declines in their populations, so uh, many people are trying to grow butterfly weeds so that they can uh, provide these, these plants uh, for monarchs. And I think it's working. I'm seeing more and more butterfly weed around and I'm seeing more monarchs. One thing uh, that I want to mention just to uh, kind of uh, keep your eyes out here is when we are planting native plants in our landscaping and our goal is to help feed the food web, it's important that we not get freaked out when we notice that those plants are indeed contributing to the food web. So this is a picture here that I took in my garden. So this is a butterfly weed and butterfly weed really commonly gets these little tiny yellow aphids and aphids reproduce asexually. So their populations can explode really quickly such to the point that you can have just the entire stem of your plant would be covered with these little yellow aphids. Don't freak out. Don't worry about it. Um, that's, that's the whole end game here. We want the plant to be providing food for the bugs and then the bugs will be providing food for other bugs and then those bugs will be eaten by birds. Uh, we have a, a whole little food chain uh, in this picture. The ladybug is actually a, a, a voracious predator on aphids. So this ladybug is in a great position. Uh, she's going to get a lot of food from those aphids. And here's a little, uh, little woody, woolly aphid up here. So um, it's not a bad thing if the bugs start eating your plants. We actually want that. Um, I always have these guys covering my milkweed and the milkweed comes back. It has no problem with this whatsoever. Um, those stems, those leaves might disappear. Um, the whole thing might uh, die back to the ground and be consumed, but it will sprout back. It will sprout back um, and it will just keep doing what it's doing and just keep contributing. So no worries there. But I wanted to also uh, make the point that uh, butterfly weed is not the only type of milkweed out there. There are actually numerous species of milkweed and all of these species of milkweed would play the same role in terms of contributing to food for uh, developing monarch butterflies. So um, this is Asclepius variegata. Uh, sometimes this is called um, red ring milkweed or something like that. Um, and this is uh, a common uh, milkweed, Asclepius incarnata. We've got more than six or eight different native species of Asclepius. Asclepius is the, um, is the genus for milkweeds. Um, so, you know, if you are interested in providing food for monarchs, um, you know, reach out a little bit, uh, get outside the, the traditional um, simply orange uh, butterfly weed. There are lots of other sorts of things that you could provide as well. Um, the flowers of the uh, common milkweed, the, these pink flowers here, smell just wonderfully. Oh my gosh, they, they produce quite an aroma. Those guys will, will attract pollinators for miles around, I'm sure. Uh, one species of milkweed that you don't want to get is Asclepius carassavum. Yeah, I can never say this one. Um, but this is a species of milkweed that looks remarkably similar to butterfly weed. Uh, but in addition to the orange on the flowers, it also has red. And this is actually a species of milkweed that is native to Central and South America. It's not native to here, and it has uh, been shown to be aggressive in some places. 
And it also has a very extent, uh, extended growing season and flowering season compared to our native milkweeds. And that actually uh, might be deterring some of our butterflies from migrating on their appropriate schedule. So we want to uh, try to not encourage that. So um, this plant is for sale um, at many garden centers, uh, but you don't want the one that's orange and red. Okay, so uh, your take home message here is to help feed the food web, use native plants in landscaping, not exotics. You wanna go for your native grasses, native asters, native hollies and so on, and stay away from all of the, whoops, um, all of these uh, non-native species that are very prevalent. Um, one other thing I wanted to notice, uh, wanted to um, show you here um, is that it's very important in our landscaping, if we can have different layers of plants, the more layers of plants we have, uh, the more diverse habitats and niches we're providing for wildlife. So uh, this is my front yard, which <laughs> looks a little messy. This was in late spring when uh, I was actually trying to let the grasses grow and go to seed. And um, I was lucky that my neighbors were, um, were pretty okay with that. Uh, I've got lots of white clover here mixed in with the grasses. Uh, we've got a layer of low shrubs here. And then I've got some uh, some mid-story trees, is dogwoods, um, and then I've got my upper story trees um, up here, the canopy trees, the tulips and oaks and hickories and such. So I've got various layers here and there will be different kinds of, of bugs in these different layers and different kinds of birds foraging in these layers. So if you want to um, increase diversity and increase uh, the number of layers that you have in your landscape as well. Um, one more thing uh, just to note is, and this is becoming more common and I'm so excited to see this, to help birds this winter go easy on your fall yard work. So the messier your yard is, the better it is for wildlife. So um, yeah, the less work you do, the better it is. <laughs> this works out quite well for us, right? Um, so many insects like bumblebees, for example, will spend the winter under the leaf litter, under the ground. So if we protect uh, that leaf litter for them, um, then we will be able to have more insects in the spring, which will provide more, um, more food for our baby birds. Uh, this cute little butterfly lays its um, eggs in the uh, fallen oak leaves. And then uh, those dead leaves are the food source for, uh, for the caterpillars in the spring. Uh, many people, if they leave their leaves in their yard, will go through and mulch them up, uh, break them into small pieces with the mower um, so that they will decompose faster. That's good because you're um, leaving those leaves and they are able to break down and regenerate um, and fertilize the soil. But if you've got a lot of uh, overwintering caterpillars in your leaf litter, if you're chopping them all up, um, that's not going to be good for them. So that is something to consider as well. If you can uh, maybe rake the leaves over to one area of the yard and, and just let them overwinter there, uh, then that would be even better. Okay, um, yeah, so I'll just leave you with this here. Um, and one more thing to mention, um, the other day I went online uh, to do some searches uh, just to get some lists of most popular landscaping plants uh, right now, because in recent years, um, if you go to you know the, the garden center at Lowe's or Home Depot, most of what you see there are um, actually invasive exotic plants, uh, ones that we don't necessarily want to be propagating. Uh, but when I went uh, online the other day and looked at these lists, I was really pleasantly surprised at how many native plants are now popping up on these lists. And um, even the first plants that uh, were present on the website for Lowe's for the garden center were actually all native plants. So that's really exciting. Native plants are becoming uh, more acceptable for you to have in your yard. And more of the horticulturalists are actually propagating these native plants, making them easier for us to uh, find and use in our landscaping. So. Uh, I will leave you with that um, happy positive note um, for the end of the session. I'm happy to take any kinds of questions that you'd like to ask. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. That was great. 
Um, we did have one person already in the chat ask if you would share the list of recommended natives. Absolutely. I can send that to Serena and she can pass that along to the group. However, yep. however is the best way to communicate with them. Yep, um, I sure will. Thank you. Um, and if anyone has a question, I see one person with their hand raised right now. Yes. Um, Gail Weeks and I will allow you to talk or you can drop it in the chat, if, whichever you're more comfortable. Hi, Hi Gail. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. Um, so I've been trying to convert my yard to native plants and unfortunately, Oh. I think you kind of cut out there. I heard unfortunately, and then you went silent. I have butterfly bushes. Should I get rid of them? Hmm. Well, I tend to take a, an approach in my yard that is um, staggered according to um, how evil they are. Well, <laughs> so I didn't know they were evil. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, butterfly bush is something that um, is not, it's not present at high numbers in our woods uh, right now, but it's something that has been noticed um, that it is getting out. So it is beginning to spread into our native areas. So if you can, um, if you can cut down um, your butterfly bush and get rid of it, that's great. If you are not at the point where you feel like you can do that, um, if you can simply cut off the ends of the branches after they've finished flowering, that will prevent them from setting seed um, and that will prevent the seeds from getting out into wild areas at least. So sometimes if I have some plants that, um, and I, I've had a lot of um, Japanese privet and Chinese holly that I've been trying to tackle over the past few years. And um, I'll just go out there with the clippers and clip off the ends of all of the branches before they set seed. Um, and then, you know, okay, I, I don't have the time and the energy right now to be able to dig all of those big shrubs out, uh, but I can at least prevent them from spreading. So that's a way to start. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. Great question. Um, yeah, there's a question in the chat. Do you have recommended natives for shady areas? Um, tons of them. Um, and uh, I can include things like that in the list that I sent to Serena. Um, just a few things off the top of my head would be um, oak leaf hydrangea. That's one of my favorites. Um, I have had a lot of luck with that one in particular. Um, Right now I'm in my yard, I have a situation where it used to be shady and now it's sunny and I'm hoping that it will be shady again. So that's, that's kind of a challenge. Um, there are, let's see, um, I have a lot of sourwood right now. Um, some azaleas, native azaleas do wonderfully in shady areas. Um, let's see, a witch hazel is a nice small understory tree that would also do well there, um, along with things like dogwoods. Um, yeah, so those would be some of the, the first ones that come to the top of my, the top of my head to share. All right, I see a question here. Uh, will pruning negatively impact native plants and shrubs? No, not really. Um, so whenever you are pruning um, a plant, uh, if you cut off the end of a branch, that will basically stimulate uh, that branch to sprout other branches off the sides. So um, of course, it depends on how aggressively you're pr pruning, but typically um, just pruning a plant will um, help keep it more compact and can actually uh, cause it to form more lateral branches, which may result in it producing more flowers and more fruits. So um, that's a, a benefit, beneficial thing to do. Um, I commonly do that in my shrubs if they're getting really leggy um, or with, for example, goldenrod that wants to be eight, 10, 12 feet tall, uh, and then it'll just flop over because it gets too heavy. Um, I will usually cut those back a couple of times during the growing season. And it doesn't seem to phase them whatsoever. They do just fine. And then similar question in the chat. Um, I've heard that it's good to cut milkweeds in the late summer to encourage new fresh growth for the fall flush of monarchs. Do you advise this? I've never had the opportunity to do that because mine tend to be mowed down by bugs. 
uh, before they get to that point. Um, you certainly can. When mine do get demolished by bugs, um, they then sprout right back uh, with fresh new growth. So um, if you've got a situation where you've got some milkweeds that uh, maybe are looking a little old and ratty and they've finished flowering and they've finished setting seed um, and it just looks like they're not doing much else, yeah, sure, you know, cut off those stems halfway up. Uh, you'll probably see some new stems come up with some new leaves and, um, and they'll just keep doing their thing. Any more questions from anybody else? Not seeing any hands. So um, that was great. Um, loved your presentation and thank you for joining us, Carrie. Sure thing, my pleasure. Anytime, I could keep talking forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of my neighbors have beds of lantana, good or bad, that's bad. Um, lantana is, uh, yeah, that species is becoming very invasive in uh, more southern places. I expect that we will be having problems with that plant uh, being invasive here very, very soon. Um, I would encourage them to dig up all the lantana, get rid of it, and replace that with some wonderful native plants. Go native. Yay, um, go native. Yep. <laughs> Oh, the best way to go wisteria. I don't know, but I wish someone would tell me because I have wisteria attempting to take over my yard and that stuff is horrible. Um, I do not know. Uh, but if you go to the page invasive.org, uh, they've got some resources there for uh, managing invasive plants. So they may have some good guidance for you there. Awesome. All right, so if any of you out there want some packets of seeds, you could send Serena an email. She's got some seeds for um, some seed mixes with purple coneflower and butterfly weed and um, some brown eyed Susan and the partridge pea, all very excellent native species for sunny areas. Um, they do excellent in dry areas as well. No need for irrigation unless we're going two, three, four weeks without rain, um, but they, uh, they are very hardy and very, uh, very easy to grow, so. Yeah, so um, I'll send out, once I get the list from Carrie, I'll send it out to all the people who are on the webinar and you can let me know about the seed packets. They're from the North Carolina Wildlife Federation's Butterfly Highway Program. So we love to support that. All right. Well, thank you, awesome. Carrie, and thanks everybody for coming. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you about my passion. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.